language and programming channel. You're here first, a thousand fine points. Magic is the top reason why Christians and Muslims believe. Justin Maurer, PhD in Pine Creek Studies. Yes, Justin has uh, watched all the videos, and once you watch all my videos, you get a, a real PhD, not like the fake ones that Rabbi Zachari <laughs> Zacharias got. Uh, and third place, Joshua Howard. No, you can't claim first. Your third, 255, 250 pine points for you, 500 for Justin, 1,000 for Language and Programming Channel. So this is, uh, yeah, I know I'm competing against atheist experience. And um, I, uh, I want Christians to call in and give me their top three reasons, or Muslims, top three reasons why they believe. And uh, a lot of Christians, I think, might even find that daunting to just pick three. Or they can call in and tell me, what's the best part about being a Christian or a Muslim? What's the best part? Or a third option you can uh, answer for me is tell me about a specific doubt that you currently have about what you believe and uh, or maybe one that you've had in the recent past. So top three reasons, uh, talk about doubts. What was the second thing I said? Uh, you can play back the tape. Now, in the meantime, uh, so I got this whereby address on the top. All you have to do is you type that in your browser. It'll take you to my thing. Oh, but you know what I should do? I should lock it. There we go. Make sure we don't get any scoundrels in here. <laughs> and uh, so I was debating what I'm going to do in the meantime. Do I talk about Father Vince Lampert? A lot of people want me to talk about that one. It's just so embarrassingly. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's just, I don't know. This one was uh, suggested from a subscriber, I think, the Javier Javier show, which I thought was really interesting. I guess the guy on the right here is named Javier, and he has a debate with a precept Christian. And I just thought it was hilarious. So I might do that. But first of all, I'm going to look at the chat. Hey, good to see you here. Fart Air Woman. <laughs> That's an interesting name. interesting name. I don't think I've seen you here before. Holy Shift is here. Tariq Ahmed. See, I, I know how to say that, right, Tariq? Ahmed. Tariq Ahmed. I hope that's not offensive, but I, I like that name. Uh, new camera? What do you, do you guys notice a difference in the camera? It's not a new camera, actually. Please give Kevin his pine points. Kevin? Which Kevin? Kevin doesn't get any pine points. It's language and programming, Justin and Joshua. Kevin doesn't deserve any. Oh, who's, uh, maybe it's for a different reason. Seeing triggered Christian motivates me so much. Yeah, I kind of like it when, when people get triggered. What's a good way to trigger me? That's what you guys got to figure out. I will imagine Pine Creek having merch someday, but I doubt it. Do you, I don't know. Do YouTubers make money off merch? Like, is it worth doing? By the way, um, a subscriber insisted in paying me money the other day, and this subscriber had a great idea, and that is he sent me an Amazon gift card. And so all I did was give my Amazon Prime address, and if you think about it, that's the best way, and there's no fees, no Patreon fees, no nothing. It's like a barter system. I use Amazon all the time. So if you guys really want to give me money, let me know and I'll send you my email address, which is different than the one in the About tab. Can you call the agnostic experience? <laughs> I should call into the atheist experience and pretend to be a Christian. Nah, I've done that too many I don't like, I, I'm kind of bored of that. Paula White already working in the office? Uh, no, no, the contract is not finalized yet. Um, but it will be nice to have Paula on the team. Do an Amazon wish list. No, I, I don't think uh, I do an Amazon wish, wish list. I'll just do, if you want to donate, you can, um, you can send me an Amazon gift card. Doug, you should have tons of cash considering how much money you've saved on tithes. Well, that's one way to look at it. That's one bonus about not being a Christian. 
is you don't have to give tithes. Here's an int another interesting question for Christians or, yeah, for Christians, is when you give money, do you give 10%? And if so, at least 10%. And if so, do you give it all to the same place? Or do you think it's okay to, to spread that 10% around? That's actually a big issue among Christian circles. Some pastors will say, no, you got to give 10% to the, your home church. And then anything above and beyond that, you can spread around. I'm curious to know what Christians think about that. Doug is untriggerable. He's dead inside. Well, I'm not quite, I'm almost dead inside. I'm like, um, what's that movie? Princess Bride? Almost dead. If you take um, one of those big things, um, what do you call those, like for the, for the fireplace? and you squeeze it into my mouth, you'll get some life out of me. What percentage of the Super Chat do you keep? See, uh, it's not much. I, well, no, it's the majority, but I think it's 65 or 75% of the Super Chats I keep. So yeah, if you do want to give me money, the best way is through Amazon Prime. There's zero fees, and it's a complete barter system. It's actually not even taxable because it's a gift. Unless you get over $12,000 per year, it's not taxable. I, this is a secret I guess I shouldn't even tell people about. Because Patreon, well, we could actually take, YouTubers could, get, could do some serious damage to Patreon if they just insisted everybody send them Amazon gift cards. No Christians in my family, which was my entire family, ever tied. Good to see here. Dinah Cat loves me. I think your name is new. Ironically, Catholics are less strict about tithing than they are about works. Yeah, who's actually, I think Muslims are more strict about, they don't call it tithing, but giving to the poor than I think Christians are. Are they not? There's a Muslim in the crowd that can let me know. Does your wife still tithe? I think so. I think she tithes on, on what she makes. And she's a teacher, so she doesn't make much. She works like, I would say, three times harder than I do. And I probably make three times more than she does. <laughs> Something like that. It's like, it's sad. Yeah, one of the five pillars of Islam is giving. By the way, let me know if something's weird with the audio, because I changed my camera. I changed my audio. Let me know if the audio sounds better or worse or the same. Let me know if... The video is uh, better, worse, or the same. You, should, it's sh you shouldn't say the same. I'm doing good, Chad. No Chad Eckert for a long time. Your wife ties on what you make. Ooh, sorry. So I'm going to start a video now. Christians, feel free to call in. Tell me about... Uh, and you know what? I'm, I'm in a nice mood today. I'm feeling good. If, um, if you call in as a Christian or a Muslim and you don't want me to push back, I won't. I'll just, um, I'll repeat what you say to me. It'll be kind of boring if you don't let me at least ask you some questions. But if, you're just, if you just want to come in and give me your three reasons and leave, fine. If you want to just come in tell me about some doubts you've had and leave, fine. Um, I actually, in a way, prefer that. Because I, 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 hate, I hate this sort of, sort of thing. Oh, that was a great Quit answer. talking man. those long, drawn-out answers. <laughs> like yeah, long, drawn-out answers. I don't like those. Pine Creek, you look younger. Did you take Regeneron? Shh. Actually, I have a very good friend who works for Regeneron. And so uh, if I ever get sick, because I'm such an important person in the United States, like Trump... Uh, I'll get the best care. I can get those pills sent to me via Amazon gift card. The Rege Regeneron pill that saved Trump's life, I can get. Audio and video, good? Okay, thanks, Alan Bird. <laughs> love, and, love and happiness from Canada. Oh, look at all those hearts. Well, thank you so much, James Payne. James Payne, with all the hearts, what province do you live in? You must be from Alberta with all that love. 
The video is a little blurrier than usual. Really? Really? Let me try something. Okay, I'm going to go fuzzy for a second. There we go. Let me fine tune, just like God did with the universe. I'm going to fine tune. That's pretty clear to me. What number do you need to call, Lord Melissens? Well, the, there's no phone number. It's on the screen on the top. It's a um, internet website. Who's my favorite apologist? I think it's going to be this uh, this guy right here. <laughs> He's going to be fun to listen to. Looks clear even at 480. Yeah, you know what I did? I just went to filters, and you know how people smooth over the fil using smoothing filters? I did the opposite. I, I did like sharper filter. I look taller too? Wow. It's like I'm 10 feet tall and bulletproof today. Yeah, it's crisper. More well, I did wash my hair just before the live stream. Can I do a metal soundtrack to Paula White? Sure, it's a free country. Oh, snap, Shannon Q is... Oh, Shannon Q is on Ethics Experience? Can you call in about a different belief? Oh, my guess is if you're a vegan atheist, uh, you want to talk about veganism? The new settings make me pop. You can't see my nipples, can you? Oh, not, not that type of pop. No, I don't. Actually, I used to use Rogaine, but I just used it as a gel thing. It's really cheap at Costco. I didn't shave. Yeah, I'm a little scruffy. Will you be accepting Kamala Harris's nominating you to VP? <laughs> well, I'm Canadian, so that won't work. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's play a little bit. Now, this is a the Javier show. Uh, how many subscribers does he have? Why can't I see it? I guess he has it hidden. Only seventy views. So again, you know, I just don't focus on people with thousands of views. I'm gonna give this guy a like. And uh, so the guy on the right's an atheist, I believe, and he's asking. And the guy on the left is a precept. Go uh, religious debate. So I figured we could actually get on and talk about is God good and is it possible for God to be evil? So I'm pretty sure you take the side that God is good. And I figured that'd be a great place to start. Um, what is it about God that makes you think he's good? What is it about God <clears throat> that makes me think he's good? Yeah, this is an excellent question that I think every Christian and even Muslim should be asked. And really, there's only one right answer, and that is God is good by definition. You can't look at the things God has done in the past and say that is good by just merely looking at it and making a judgment. You can't judge God to be good or evil if you're a Christian or a Muslim. You can't, you can't do, be a judge because that puts you above God. So basically, the answer is by definition. This is the same question as why is sin bad? Well, it is, sin is bad by definition. Well, uh, the answer to that would be informed by my worldview. Uh, oh, Michael, Michael asked a great question. Why has the subscriber count been locked at 10K? It's, it's a YouTube thing that once you get uh, five digits, they only go to three digits for, so until I get 100 new subscribers, then you'll see 10.1K. Which is that uh, God exists, and um, the, he's, the, I would have a Christian worldview, so the scriptures would be the foundation for my worldview. So the scripture says that God is good, and therefore that's why I would say that God is good. Which is basically what I said. It's by definition. The scriptures say it, so it must be true by definition. And what makes you think that you can rely on the scriptures to tell you that God is good? Well— um, there are some reasons I can give for why I believe in the scriptures, but the scriptures are my ultimate authority. So okay. if I said, so if I said, I believe in the scriptures because of this, then whatever that is, is actually my ultimate authority. Okay. Can someone say that their ultimate authority 
is a scripture or scriptures or a text or a book and be mistaken? Christians would have to say, of course, Muslims, Mormons, the Vedas, Hindus. But in our case, we're not mistaken. Okay, uh, one's ultimate authority really can't be challenged. So I believe God is good, I, or I believe the scriptures are my ultimate authority. So I can't, I can't base that on anything. Now, he made a mistake there. He shouldn't say, I believe the scriptures are my ultimate authority. He says, I choose the scriptures as my ultimate authority. Do I have reasons for thinking that the ultimate authority that I've, uh, that I've, trusted in is is reliable yeah i yes. do but i don't rely on those things i rely on the ultimate authority itself which which can't be tested on so he's admitted here he doesn't rely on the reasons to think that scripture is from god he's he doesn't rely on the evidence he starts with it being true on any level other than itself all right so let's try to make some sense of that because <laughs> I, i'm confused and i'm pretty sure other people might be confused okay. um so you're saying that the Bible is your ultimate authority. Right. And you came to the conclusion that the Bible is your ultimate authority based on what? What was it that led you to think the Bible should be your ultimate, you know, um, standard? Great question. For authority. Well, again, uh, when I became a Christian, I just accepted the Bible as my ultimate authority. Okay. Oh. Uh, um, and especially, especially when I was a, a young Christian, I first became a Christian, I didn't know anything you know, in terms of apologetics or anything like that. So when he first became a Christian, he knew nothing, almost nothing about apologetics. Yeah, that's the case. I think if I was to get put a number on it, 90, 95% of Christians, that's the case. Those Christians who say it's apologetics that led me into Christianity or Islam or whatever. Yeah, it can happen, but it's rare. In fact, so rare, I have my huge doubts. <laughs> I was told that the Bible is the Word of God, and so I just accepted it as the Word of God. But if it is the Word of God, I can't, I can't subject it to any, any external verification. It's either my ultimate authority or it's not. So if it's I basically... It, if I subject it, it to external verification, then whatever that external thing is then becomes higher than my ultimate authority. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so it's kind of like a leap of faith, or in, in a sense... Um, yeah, we, we all do it, but you can't get around it. So what in faith? Do you, do you agree with him here? Uh, by the way, this is the Javier Javier show. Can God be evil? Uh, what's the name of the guy on the left? He doesn't say. Huh. But do you agree with him that... Um, re rewind. Uh, so it's kind of like a leap of faith or in, in a sense. Um, yeah, we, we all do it, but you can't get around it. Do we all have an ultimate authority? I tend not to push back on this when I talk to precepts and I say, yeah, I have an ultimate authority. My ultimate authority is my presuppositions. My presupposition is basically my foundation, which is that we exist, the universe exists. It has the properties that it has. And from that, we can build upon it, learn things and so forth. So wouldn't faith be your ultimate authority if you rely on faith to actually have the Bible as your ultimate authority? You, the faith comes first, right? Well, my faith is in scripture. I mean, if, if you want to say that, okay, fine. But that reduces everyone's ultimate authority to faith. I, mean, I don't think, you know, I, I, don't, I don't look at it. I say my ultimate, I believe. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't even push back on that if someone was to reverse these questions on me. And I would say, uh, well, yeah, if you want to view faith as trust, like I trust that we're not in a matrix. I trust that reality is objectively real. Can I prove, demonstrate that? that we're not in the matrix and that every experience we've ever had was just formed in my consciousness mere seconds ago? No. The Bible is true. Therefore, it is my ultimate authority. Okay. And, we, uh, and we're really all reduced to that because, again, you can, you can choose your... Everybody has to choose their ultimate authority. And they can't... That Again, that is not subject to external verification. Otherwise, whatever they subjected it to is actually their ultimate authority. Which I would assume your faith, without your faith, you wouldn't. And remember, if there's any Christians or Muslims watching, feel free to call in. Even though I'm playing this video, I'll stop it pretty much immediately. Believe the Bible was your ultimate authority. So I would assume that your faith takes precedent over the actual Bible. Well, what you said makes sense in English. It wouldn't make sense in Greek. <laughs> it, it wouldn't make sense in Greek because in Greek, which the Bible was, uh, or the New Testament was inspired in, uh, belief and faith are the same, the same word. 
Okay. All so right, in well, English, we say, you know, we believe by faith, but in Greek, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Well, let's not get bogged down there. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. So we, yeah, we get bogged down there. Um, so what is in the Bible that makes you, uh, what in the Bible leads you to thinking God is good? Because the Bible actually says God is good. Correct. Um, do you judge any of God's actions in the Bible to determine whether he's good or not? Great question. I can't. But great, it's in the Bible. Great answer. For I mean, Prisa. can you look in the Bible and actually see things in there that God has done that would not necessarily seem good? Well, what seems good to me is irrelevant. What is good is what's relevant. And the Bible says that God is... See, even though he answers that way, he's, he's taking a pretty hard-line pre-sup stance. And he's saying, well, what seems to me as good or evil is irrelevant. But it isn't irrelevant. It, he does believe, I think, he has these um, intuitions, this moral law put on his heart by God. And when he sees something, an action, that that is like let's say a, a person stabbing an infant there's something in him that cringes and says no i need to stop this this is wrong this is bad and so in that instance is he judging that as bad or is he just reacting to it as bad i guess that's a fine line it is good i either believe that or i don't i do believe it therefore any actions that i you know sit there i look at it like you know uh, I mean, well, okay. I mean, a lot of times the genocide in, in you know, Joshua is brought up. Well, people fail to realize how evil the Canaanites were. I mean, on, on the one hand, yeah, jo yeah, they went in there and they wiped out an entire- But the thing is, he's missing the point. He's, if the Canaanites were so evil, it doesn't matter. It does not matter if the Canaanites were evil. If God wants to wipe the Canaanites for a different reason, if God, in fact, you could reverse it. What if the Canaanites were more righteous than the Israelites, but God, for morally sufficient reasons, wanted to wipe the Canaanites out? Then wiping the Canaanite, Canaanites out is good by definition. So a precept, in my opinion, and let me help the precepts out there, you, sh you shouldn't even answer that way. You should just say, well, if God did it, which I believe God did, according to the precept, then it's good by definition. It doesn't matter if the Canaanites were evil or not. God wiped them out. God wiped them out. Good. Entire civilization. But yet, if God didn't do that, they would complain, well, God, you see how evil this civilization is. Why don't you do something? You know, so then, then when God does do something, everybody calls God a, uh, you know, a moral monster and, and, and a genocidal maniac. Well, you, you can't have it both ways. Well, there's, so, there's a problem with that. And, and the reason I say there's a problem with it, it's not a black or white fallacy. It's, it's not either God could have wiped them out or God could have not wiped them out. There were a numerous amount of options that God could have done, um, different actions he could have taken to get the same desired effect without like wiping what? them all off the face of the earth. Oh, great question. You know, God is, is apparently pretty powerful. He can have different options. Did you hear what he, this precept guy on the left said? Like what? It's like he hasn't even imagined that. Different actions he could have taken to get the same desired effect without like wiping what? them all off the face of the earth. Like, like what? Um, like for what? instance, God could have uh, picked Oh, don't say poof. If you say poof, then that means you you watch my channel. Them up and relocated them somewhere where they couldn't harm oh. anybody else. No, they were harming themselves. Uh, I'm not talking about anybody else. I mean, they would they would have child sacrifices up to six years old, and they would take they would take those children. They would put them on the the altar uh, of Moloch, and 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 they would burn them alive. It's it said that that they would beat the drums when this was happening so loud that the parents couldn't hear the screams of their children. I mean, so the, <laughs> yeah, and Yahweh waited 400 years to exercise that justice because of the evilness of the Canaanites, and so God commanded uh, Joshua, Moses, or whoever uh, other prophets to take out people and kill infants, sacrifice infants because the bad people, the Canaanites, were sacrificing their infants. So it's just a reverse. It's just a switching from sacrificing infants to one god to a different god. That's all it is. From Baal to Yahweh. I mean, it was this. This was just a horrendous, barbaric society and, and, and civilization. No, they had to. They had to be done away with. They, you couldn't just pick them up and relocate them. They would have just started the whole thing all, over again. Okay. So from what I understand, what about the babies? Though the babies wouldn't have started again if they were brought into good Israelite homes and taught the ways of Yahweh. And you're saying is the only way to have stopped them from killing each other was to kill them all. Exactly. I don't see how 
that is the solution. In a way, for example, if some guy is raping his daughter, I don't see the solution as to go rape both of them. I, I don't see how that solves the problem of of rape. You're actually making it worse. Two wrongs don't make a right. You're just killing the killers and the ones who are going to get killed anyway. You're killing everyone instead of just a few people dying. Right. Um, but if you killed the father instead of raping the father, you would solve the problem. Yeah, but if I also kill the daughter, how is that solving the problem? Because God wiped out everyone. He didn't yes. just wipe out the murderers. He I like this Javier guy. just didn't wipe out the people who were committing the horrible acts. He wiped out everyone. Okay. Yeah, fine. Um, you know, what well, you're talking about the, the children. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, whatever God does is right. I mean, we, we can, I don't <laughs> think there's any question that when, that he wipe, his wiping out of the guilty party was, was just about the children. Well, he had his reasons for doing it. I mean, we believe that there is an age of accountability under which the children were. So those children that died, had they grown up, and yes. were as wicked as their their parents would have went to hell, just like, like their parents. But because they were slaughtered, they went to heaven? Is that the implication? And if those children would have been taken in and adopted into Isra the Israelite tribe, would they have grown up to be wicked? Well, I guess some Israelites were wicked, right? So God wiping out the children was act actually an act of mercy. And, you know, God, God is the author. And abortion today in the United States is an act of mercy. Couldn't one say that because they're relocated to heaven? Of life. He gives life. He can take away life. It's not murder when God takes a life. It's murder when we take a life because we're not the one who gave that life. But so God we can't didn't... take it unless, unless we have some sort of justification for taking that life. And our justification comes from God's word. So you're saying God was justified in sending other men to kill children because if God said, go kill these children, then you're justified. Wait, can you say that again? Okay, so you said if God when it's not murder, but God right. sent people to murder other people and children. No, no, they didn't murder them. He sent them to kill them. Uh, Killing and murder are not, the, are not the same thing. Okay, well, especially, God sent especially men. Especially in the, in, the, in the biblical languages, they're not the same thing. Okay, God sent men to kill men, women, and children and Correct. wipe out a whole civilization. Correct. And it's justified because God told them to do it. Correct. Okay, so for example, if someone got a message from God to kill someone in your family, someone you love or, <laughs> or a young one, and God told him to do it, would you be have that same mindset? Well, you know, it must have been justified. <laughs> Great question. This guy is, he asks very similar questions to what I would ask. Now, what, what do you predict his answer is going to be? Uh, it, it will have to be something like, well, God doesn't, uh, talk like that anymore. He doesn't make decrees like that anymore. Yes. Yes. But I have to throw this caveat in. <laughs> they had better truly heard from God. And how do you I, know? What's that? How do you know? Um, there's Many nothing people... in scripture. There's nothing in scripture that would lead me to believe that anyone would get a message from God to to just kill a member of my family or a member of anybody else's family. What? There's nothing in scripture? There's precedent. There's God commanding Moses, Elijah, uh, or Joshua to do these things. Can't you say precedent? Ah, but that's the Old Testament, right? Uh, that's, there, there's nothing in scripture to support that. So we I would just, have to, we, so, so we if somebody just, says, well, I got a message from God to do it. <laughs> No, I would no, no, you didn't. We just talked about us. <laughs> you got a message. You got, this is this is priceless. He's questioning whether or not someone got a message from God. Can't you question whether Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul got messages from God or inspiration in some way? How would you know? situation where God sent people to kill children. So it's not beyond God to send people to murder, I mean, to kill children. He is, he's capable of doing it. We just talked about it. Right. So right. why that is... Was, because that was, that was in a time when you Ooh. had prophets. Okay, you had people that were speaking for God. There's nobody speaking for God today? And nobody speaks for God now? Oh, no. <laughs> No. Well, they do, but, no. they, but they speak... Uh, Sorry, all you pastors out there, all you... Preachers, all you imams, all, no, no one speaks for God today. Uh, the Bible. When, when you speak the scriptures, when you preach and proclaim the scriptures, you're speaking for God. But that's, that's your only platform. Um, God doesn't give you words 
you know, of prophecy or, or, or those kind of things. Okay. So he's, yeah, most precepts, I would say all precepts are not Pentecostals who believe in prophets today. Yeah. So if, okay, so if you went to church and mm -hmm. the pastor told you that God put it on his heart and God told him that you should break up with your wife. Uh, this is a bad example. Um, would you tell him, uh, no, you don't speak for God? Absolutely. Um, divorce is a sin. God is not going to put it on anybody's heart to, to tell me to break his commandments. <laughs> so that's obviously not, not a message from God. Well, I mean, Jesus will also say, Jesus in the Bible said that if anyone were to hurt a children, you know, um, that it was like, you know, it was one of the worst things you could do by hurting a child. Yeah, it, this is, he's, he's pointing out the, um, the tension between the New Testament and the Old Testament. Jesus came to save and yet Yahweh destroyed. And well, yet, said, well, well, what, yeah, what he said was, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for that man to have a millstone tied around his neck and be cast into the depths of the sea. And yes. that's true. That's true. Yes. It would be. And it you would say that's worse than killing them? Do it. It, it, it doesn't say to go ahead and do it. It just says it would be better for him if that's what happened. But you, know, you have to leave what happens up, up to God's providence. Because basically what I'm hearing is, if God tells someone to do something, it must be justified because God is good. Correct. And the way that you know that is because the Bible says God is good. So given that circumstance, if the Bible said that Satan was good, would you accept that? Well, yeah. Sure. But then it would be a completely different Bible. It would be, it would be a complete, I mean, the whole situation would be different. It I mean, would it not? Be, it could be one sentence that that Satan is good, and you would have to accept it. Basically, well, and I think a lot of uh, Jews and some Christians will even admit that Satan, the Satan, is a messenger for God. He's God's minion. He does what God says to do. In the Bible, um, yeah, I mean, if there was one sentence at the end that said Satan is good, and then the rest of the scripture was clear on the nature of Satan, that Satan is evil, then I would have to say, well, <clears throat> um, the Bible is my ultimate authority. I How can Satan be evil? This is weird. How can Satan be evil if, if the Jews are right that he was placed in our world to tempt us in order so our free will is really free? Isn't Satan just doing what God wants him to do? Can't question it. Therefore, there must be some way to reconcile this last sentence <laughs> with everything else, with everything else that it says. And if I, don't have the, if I don't have a way to reconcile it, I'll just have to, you know, I'll, I'll find out what the uh, what, what the method was someday, but I just don't have it now. But yeah, is it is it possible for the Bible to be wrong? No. <laughs> don't you love that? Is it possible? Is it possible for the Quran to be wrong? Yes. Now, why is it possible for the Quran to be wrong and not the Bible? So if it's not possible for the Bible to be wrong, I'm, I'm pretty sure you understand that. I mean, let's, let's, put people... let's, let's put it this way. I mean, of course, it's possible for the Bible to be wrong. I... Oh, now he's backtracking on it. So, yes, it is possible for the Bible to be wrong. It could be wrong. I could be wrong about uh, that, that. That's not that's not true either, because uh, I'm as a presuppositionalist. No, it's not possible for me to be wrong. Let's put it this way. <laughs> well, and some presuppositionalists would disagree with me about this, but it's possible that I could be wrong about the Bible being the, the revelation of God. So yes, I, I could be wrong about that. I can't be wrong about the existence of God, but I can be wrong about the revelation of God. That's, that is possible. I would have jumped on that question, and maybe this guy will. Uh, is it possible that you're wrong on your vision of God, of what you think this God is like, the nature of this God? Could a God exist, but have this God have nothing to do with the God of the Bible. Yeah. Okay. So, you, you, all right. Because I'm having a hard time really grasping this because what you're, it seems like a special pleading fallacy where you're saying that if the Bible says something, it must be true. But I can't use that same standard on any other book. Like if I use the Quran, for example, and I said that, you know, the Quran says this and it doesn't say this in the Bible, you would err on the side of the Bible. But somebody with the Quran can make the same argument that you're making. Correct. So how... Correct. That's what I said at the beginning. We, we're all reduced to this. We all have to choose what our ultimate authority is. We, we, we but, can't get away with that. So the Muslim is going to choose the Quran as his ultimate authority. And I, as a Christian, I'm going to choose the Bible as my ultimate authority. And you, Bible? as an atheist, are going to choose something else as your ultimate authority. The question is, 
And what he means by ultimate authority, I know precepts enough to know what he means by that. What he means by ultimate authority is your core um, presuppositions, your properly basic beliefs. And I would say that my ultimate authority is more properly basic than his. It's something that all religions of the world share, is that there is a universe, it's real, it has the properties that he has, that we, we learn from it. Uh, now we disagree with uh, you know, whether it took millions of years for life forms to evolve into intelligence that we have now, that we can figure things out more so, better, better than um, primitive life forms. That's where we disagree. Which Bible? Oh. Which Bible? There's yes. only, you mean which translation? He was about to say there's only one Bible. Yes. I mean, let's put it this way. I don't, as far as the New Testament goes, I don't, I read translations, but I don't rely on them. I, I read the original Greek. Now, I don't know Hebrew, but um, I'm told that the ESV, the NASB, um, <clears throat> uh, well, yeah, I, I guess the ESB and the NASB are probably your two best translations. They're, they're the two. Yeah, the issue is not translation. The issue is there's some Bibles out there that have more books than other Bibles. There's the, isn't there a Greek Orthodox Bible? Um, isn't there uh, even the a Russian Bible? Maybe I don't know. But the Catholics have a different Bible than the Protestants. That I stick with. And why choose those translations over because, all the other translations? Because they're because number one, they're they're the most accurate. And Based on what? How do you know if you don't have the original manuscripts of well, each and every single book? Well, we do have we we don't have the original manuscripts, but the manuscripts that we do have, we know are reliable. We know that we know within like a half a percent what the original authors. We know they're reliable within half a percent. What if that half percent is uh, huge? Wrote through the through the science of textual criticism, or well, the art and science of textual criticism. Because what it seems like you said, the Bible is your ultimate authority, but yet. You still need all of these other translations. You need to understand Greek. You need all these other things to say, I reliably think this version of the Bible, this translation of the Bible is the one that I should rely on. By the way, if a precept calls in, I, I'm open to any Christian or Muslim calling in. Um, would you answer the same way as this guy if you're a precept? I'm very curious to know. And is your reason, best reason to believe just by definition, is that what you're going to say to me? Both. Well, again, I read the Greek. So as far as the New Testament goes, I don't need a translation. So knowing Greek... I, I would really love to test this guy if he really knows Greek or not. Greek, I can recommend a translation to you. If you say, I really want to know what the, what the Bible teaches, I'll say, I would recommend the ESV or the NASB if you really want to understand what the scripture says. So what if I really want to understand, you'll learn the original language. <laughs> but, I mean, what about the books like uh, the Apocrypha, for example? Do you accept that as doctrine that should be in the Bible? I do and not. Wh and why, why not? Uh, well, Jesus and the apostles never accepted them as scripture. The Jews never accepted the Apocrypha as scripture. Did Jesus accept every single book in the Bible as scripture? Like, do you need Jesus to say, uh, I accept this book of the Apocrypha, one of the books, in order for... Like, if you use that standard, then I don't know. Like, I think there's several books in the Old Testament that Jesus never referenced. And I think the New Testament, well, the, the New Testament wasn't even around when Jesus walked the planet. So he never attested to the New Testament being scripture or part of any canon. That's a terrible answer from this precept, I think. The Man, Jews Paul never says accepted the New Testament as scripture either. They were really did. The Jews don't believe Jesus died and um, was the Son of God. They don't believe the, first the teachings Christians of the were New Jews. Testament. The first Christians were Jews. But we're talking about the Jews. Well, Jews and Gentiles. Today. Well, I guess the very first were Jews. I mean, the, the, the Jewish scholars today don't accept the New Testament as being right. Rich. Right. Yeah, you, you asked me, do I accept the Apocrypha? And I said, no, the Jews did not. I'm, I was referring to the Jews at the time of inscripturation and at the time but of Jesus. And most of the Jews didn't accept the New Testament either at, during those times. Some did, but not all of them. But the Christians did, I which mean, were course. all Jews. There were no Gentiles. At the beginning of the church, there were no Gentiles. They were all Jews. Yeah, but how do you know the Jews that accepted it versus the ones who didn't accept it? How do you know which one is right? Good question. How do I know which one is right? 
uh, in, in terms of what? The Apocrypha? Yeah, you said the uh, Jews, oh, the, the Christians, because you do remember that Constantine, um, and he said... If you even look at the very first King James Bible of 1618, 1607, 16, uh, something like that, the very first English translation, King James Bible, had the Apocrypha in it. Hey, all you King James only people out there, did you know that? Down with his council, and they pick and chose which books would go in the Bible and which ones wouldn't. Yeah, that was 300 and some years later. Yeah. The, the, and the, so the church was thoroughly uh, uh, Hellenized at that point. <laughs> so you don't know which ones of uh, those books that they didn't put in oh, there could be a oh, part wait. of scripture. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, make your point again, because I, I was thinking as soon as you said Constantine, I started thinking something else. Please make your point again, because I, I think the you council, going... the council of Nicaea, when when um, Constantine and they pick and chose which books would go in the Bible and which ones wouldn't. No, and no, no, no that's historically uh, inaccurate. Uh, the Council of Constantine had, or the Council of um... <clears throat> shoot, what was it? Constantine, uh, Nicaea. Jeez, man. Yeah, I'm, that's what I said. You, you, oh, okay. Oh, you said Nicaea. Yeah, Council okay, of I didn't Nicaea. Hear you say Nicaea. I just heard you say Constantine. Well, you can tell I'm getting, I'm 58. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right. Yeah, uh, the Council of Nicaea had absolutely nothing. To what do. what we're learning from this, though, is just saying that something's true by definition by presupposition is not as easy as it looks. <laughs> you can chip away at a presupper, and this guy named Javier on the Javier Javier show is doing a great job. To do with the canon canon of scripture, nothing at all. Nothing at all. No, the two canons are the two councils that had anything to do with with the. Uh, with the scriptures were the Council of Hippo and the Council of Carthage, um, somewhere somewhere around the third century, um, or third or fourth. I'm I'm a little sketchy, but those were those were in fact the two councils. Okay, so you and notice that this Protestant precept guy is relying on Roman Catholicism to define what his Bible is. You're not willing to say there are things in the Bible that could be wrong or mistranslated, or we were missing sure, part, sure. parts of the scripture. So how do you know you can 100% rely on the Bible? What well, if the part that says that God is good was changed? Well, you, you were talking about mistranslations? Well, I'm talking, you said the Bible is your ultimate authority. Right. And we're trying to establish how do you know the Bible that you're reading and the words that you're reading is actually the, the right translation? Or if it wasn't... He shouldn't be using the translation. He should just say, how do you know the Bible you're reading is the right Bible that has the right number of books in it that... There shouldn't be an extra book in it or uh, one taken out. That even within each book, that every verse is correct. How do you know that when, when I say the word Bible, that means the word of God, perfect? Changed at some point before anyone got their hands on it to last to the current day. Okay, because the New Testament, the, ma the, the because of the way the New Testament documents, manuscripts were transmitted down through the centuries. There was never a time when any single group had control of the scriptures. So no one was able to make wholesale changes. Okay. And if anybody did make a change, it would stick out. Is that true? Out like a sore thumb. So because of the way the, the, the transmission, the way that scriptures, the manuscripts transmitted down through the centuries, uh, we know that the, the integrity was preserved. That's, that's well, how. Well, yeah. And someone in the live stream chat, the integrity was preserved. But then why do we have manuscripts? Older manuscripts with no long ending of Mark and newer manuscripts with the long ending of Mark. Hmm? Riddle me that. Even if it's just one verse, just one verse is, is in question. Doesn't that cast doubt on the whole thing? Well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there were a lot of the scriptures that were passed down by sheer word of mouth. It was not written down for a while. True. True. So something could have changed in the story as it was being passed from one person to the next person by mouth, and you wouldn't know the difference. That's true. So That's it's true. possible that there are things in your Bible that are incorrect. I, I, I admit it. I could be wrong about Scripture being the revelation of God. I, I admitted that. So God could be evil, and you may not <laughs> know it. No, now you're talking about a different... Now you're talking about a different... Uh... But you said God is good because the Bible... Oh, Javier has set the trap, and now he's reeling this pre-supper in. The Bible says he's good. But it could have said God was evil, and somebody changed it to good, word to mouth, and you only get in the version that says God is good. No, um, you're talking about the Gospels that were, that were the stories that were passed on 
you know, orally until they were finally written down in the Gospels. It's the epistles that were written directly. So I'm getting direct testimony from the authors saying that God is good. There's there's no way for that to be miscommunicated. That's that's direct. direct okay, so immediate. You, okay, so let, let, let's try this from a different angle. Sure. All right. So what could God do to for you to think he was evil? Ooh, great question. This is a question I've asked many times. Nothing. I mean, he just took my brother in a, in a horrific uh, car accident. I'm not, I'm not going to give you the details because it was that, it was that bad. Um, but God is good. See, he just took my brother in a horrific car accident. He didn't say that his brother just happened to die. No, he believes his God took his brother, that his God is the act of not just allowing it to happen, but decreed it to happen, foreknown it to happen, um, that it was foreordained to happen. And then he follows it up by saying, God is good, which is totally useless thing to say if you're defining good as defined by the nature of your God. You're just saying God is God. Because, look, anything that God does that would that would lead me to believe that he's evil i have to look at what he what he the other things that he's done he saved me i broke his law okay i sinned i broke every single commandment that he ever gave and it says in james that if we if we keep the entire law and we stumble at one point we are guilty of the entire law that means every time every day i sin and every time i sin i break god's entire law how many millions or trillions of times have I broken God's law? And what did God do? Did he condemn me? No, he came himself and died a horrendous death on the cross to pay for that debt that I couldn't pay because he wanted me to be with him. He didn't want to condemn me. You notice how he's getting, he's getting passionate here. He's getting a little emotional. He wanted to redeem me. And so he came himself to do that. Well, and he suffered the death that he did on the cross. So I have, so anything that God does that I might be tempted to say, you know, I don't think God is good because of what he did. I have to look at the objective facts of what he did on the cross for me. And I have, you know, it's, it's, I, I, based on that, how can I? Uh, how much you want to bet that this guy got caught watching porn? I'll bet a 10,000 pine points <laughs> that his wife caught him and then he became a, presuppositional Christian apologist or apologetic type guy immediately think that God is anything but good. Okay. So it's not the murdering of children that would make you think God is evil. It's not the entire destruction of the human race, except one family that would make you think God is um, evil. Um, it's uh, Fickanel in the live, live stream chat says, this guy is nuts. No, he's not nuts. He's a Christian, not God. a presuppositional Christian. God sending Satan to toy with Job and allowing Satan to do those things to Job to prove a point. You wouldn't think that was evil either. Creating a hell where millions and maybe billions of people will die and go and be tortured for eternity. That's not enough to make you think God is evil. And you can't think of anything that God could possibly do for you to say this is evil. No, for the reasons I just said, uh, whatever reason that I would have, whatever would tempt me to think that God is evil or God is at least not as good as like what if uh, what this guy javier should do is get like really specific i think this guy's married what if beyond a shadow of a doubt like you knew with 100 percent certainty that god slash jesus slash yahweh slowly cuts up your wife into tiny pieces in front of your own eyes you know this is god doing it you don't know why but of course you would say he has morally sufficient reasons but you watch your wife scream with each cut. Would you then say your God is evil? Or would you say, go ahead, God, this is your world. I will still worship you after this. In fact, this is the way Javier should probably have worded it. Is there anything that your God could do that you would stop worshiping him rather than saying to make your God uh, be evil? Because he claims, I have the objective reality of what he did for me on the cross to redeem me okay and number two i have the bible is ultimate authority it's my ultimate standard and so the bible says god is good he is not evil and so that's what i believe god also the bible also says that god creates evil or god creates calamity yeah is that not an evil act i mean if it's described that way that god creates Ooh. good and god also creates evil 
Yeah, it's not moral evil, though. That's, calamity is evil, but it's not, it's not moral. I've heard this excuse, too, uh, from some Christians. They'll say, well, it's not moral evil. Who cares if you start putting adjectives in front of the word evil? Does God cause evil or not? Christians, are you listening? Question on the table. Does God actively, first person, cause evil or not? And if you say no, man, you better read your scriptures. Evil. What's the difference between moral evil and evil? A moral evil is if you, um, you know, if you rape somebody, that's, that's morally evil. Oh, uh, I'm going to take it a little a side question here because there's an interesting question. Eleanor Voss asks, how do you respond to Christians who don't believe Noah and the flood is not real? They don't believe it's real. Uh, and the Old Testament atrocities are not real either. How do you... I think the best way to respond to Christians who basically reject most of the Old Testament is do the time travel ex a thought experiment. Go back to the first century, find Jesus, and ask him about Noah and the flood. Ask him about Moses, Joshua, the Old Testament atrocities, and ask the, him, Jesus, was there really a, a worldwide flood that wiped out everybody but Noah's family? Jesus, did Moses, did God really, did you and God really command Moses to wipe out the Canaanites? And then, sit and, and wait for their answer because so many times when Jesus was trying was going to be trapped by the Pharisees, the authors report that Jesus would say, don't the scriptures say? Don't the scriptures say? It's really hard to imagine a Jesus that would, said, would have said, oh, no, 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 there was no real flood. It was like, yeah, it, it was a local thing. And uh, Adam and Eve, <laughs> no, they were a symbol of the first men and, and women where souls were infused no no this is like the, the mo, me commanding the, the israelites to to slaughter children no come on those old testament authors were just making stuff up and exaggerating you really think jesus would answer that way so eleanor that's how i would um talk to christians who believe who don't believe in those things okay, okay. uh but if um you know if if uh if if a building falls on you that's evil but it's not morally evil why is it evil? Well, we, we recognize, I think, I think you'll find in the dictionary that that is referred to as evil. You know, so calamity, saying, calamity is evil. It's, uh, evil is not just moral. Uh, any, anything bad uh, is considered evil, at least in English, in, in our... Okay, so let's go with that. Let's go with that. Um, if This guy should ask, if God never created, would there be evil? He has to say no. So God is responsible, at least partially, for evil. For example, you're a child in a village. A group of men come into your village and kill you and your family. You would say that's bad. So therefore, it's calamity, which is evil. Yeah. So those kids who died at the hand of soldiers who God sent to, mur to kill them. Well, wait a minute. Now, now you're saying God sent them? God sent, God sent those soldiers to wipe out a whole culture. So I'm putting you in that scenario. Would you not see that as evil? If you're the child being, being killed at that moment, that's bad to you. That, that's something bad happening to you. Is that not evil? That would be, um, in, in terms of the calamity, yeah, that would be evil. But that's as far as I could take it. So it's possible for God not to be morally evil, but it is possible for God to be evil. <laughs> God creates evil. Uh, yes, but not you, you see what's happening here is there's something tragic. I'm gonna I'm purposely psychologizing this guy and and triggering Christians listening. There's something bad happened in this guy's life, and he alluded to it earlier. And he has a deep need for hope, meaning, and purpose. And Christianity is what gave it to him. And so he. He has this, these scales, and so he has, to, he has to accept all this bull crap in order to get the good stuff. And at what point is so much bull crap going to outweigh the positives that he gets from the belief? I don't know. Not moral evil. Oh, in, other so words, in other words, the, 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 uh, um, the tsunami that happened back in 2005. You know, or and the one that happened in Japan. You know, though, though that was evil. It wasn't moral evil. 
So and the God question caused, is, God caused God caused those things. So the question, God, is it, this is the beauty in a in a sick sense of precepts. He'll just come out and say God caused what was it? Two hundred thousand people died in those tsunamis in Asia. How many years ago? Yeah, God caused that. Next is answerable to say God can be evil. Not morally, no. But he can be not morally evil, but evil. Evil in strict non-moral categories. Yes, because he says he creates evil. All right. Well, good. <laughs> I'm well, glad we got that. Not, well, wait, as long as you're seeing that, we're not talking, we're, we're outside the category of, of morality now. It's a work in progress, man. A, okay. All right, but what we're going to do, what we're going to do is I'm going to go into a Patreon section. Um, so we're going to finish this conversation, get a little deeper. Hey, uh, Kasim Dragoon, uh, how to call in? You see on the top of your screen says whereby.com forward slash Pine Creek. If you go to there on your browser, either on your phone or on your desktop, uh, just make sure you have a mic. Your phones would be good, preferable. Um, I'll see you knocking and I'll let you in. So the question uh, for Christians mostly is, uh, what are your top three reasons to believe? If you don't want me to push back, I won't push back. I'll be a gentle teddy bear and I'll just make sure I understand you. And uh, in the meantime though, so that was one of the videos that people wanted me to, or one subscriber wanted me to look at. And then here's one from, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is so, this is only eight minutes long, but this is so hilarious. Do, and even in your book, you mention how you're, you're actually taught to be a skeptic in, from, the, from the Roman church. You're taught to be skeptical Ex or, or a demon possession, something like that, is like... So this is from Capturing Christianity's channel. He has a, as you can tell, Roman Catholic priest on, who also is an uh, exorcist. He's basically like Jesus. Jesus was an exorcist, and so is this priest. The last thing that you want to conclude, and you even say, again, going back to your book, it's like the figure is what, one in 5,000 people are actually demon-possessed, according to these different criteria that are laid out. What would you say... Um, to to a, a skeptic, I can see hearing something like this. And by the way, that's wrong. It's not one in five thousand people are demon possessed. I I work for Satan. I, I got the inside track. It's closer to one in one thousand. Being like, well, we know that demon possession is just not a thing, and so you've made a mistake in ruling out these other sort of naturalistic possibilities. How would you respond to a skeptic? Well, you're right. Exorcists are trained to be skeptics ourselves, we need to exhaust every other possible explanation for what is happening in the life of a person before labeling that person as possessed and needing special prayers of the church. Okay, that's great. I love that. So the last option of the list of options is that they're possessed by a demon. So the church says that I need to reach moral certitude, that beyond a doubt, I believe that this is something of a demonic nature. So the church will utilize experts in the mental health field as well as are these experts in the mental health field do they happen to be roman catholics as well i wonder medical doctors so the church wants these professionals to weigh in basically saying is there something about this person's condition that is beyond your training or understanding the church is not asking the psychiatrist or the doctor do you believe this person is possessed the church herself will make that determination but the church does want to make the best possible judgment and so wants these experts to weigh in on the matter. I often believe that if the church was too quick to label somebody as being possessed and that label prevents the person from getting the true help they need, such as from a psychiatrist or a psychologist, then the church will be doing greater harm. So again, the church wants to provide the person with the help they truly need, not necessarily the help they think they need. Yeah, the help they truly need, which sounds like he's saying is real medical doctors. And that help could be spiritual, it could be mental, or it could be physical. So going back to the book, again, I might just be referencing it every time I speak. You were talking about your first, I think it was your first experience in a real life exorcism. And you mentioned that the, was it the priest who was actually con conducting it? You were in the room with him and you were kind of like, what am I getting myself into? 
But you mentioned what was interesting is you mentioned that he was doing all of these different things. He like brought in a, a paper towel roll. He brought in a little bag and he like set it on the, the radiator and he was just like prepared for all these things to happen, like the foaming. Did he bring in a video camera? At the mouth, he just like blotted it out a little bit, put it in the in the little plastic bag. But he throughout this, what he was doing, you mentioned remembering that he just had no fear. Is that is that something that eventually like were you fearful in that moment? And if so, is that something that's gone away over the over time? Absolutely. I think fearful at the beginning was natural just to see things that aren't a normal part of your everyday life. You know, again, in that case, you know, a general question to ask people who believe in an exorcism is, OK. You're put in a situation where you think an exorcism is taking place. If the Pine Creek organization were to gather up millions of dollars to recreate that scene using paid actors and tricks, illusions, could we do it? And would you still be convinced it was from real demons? If the person, once the demon manifested, the eyes rolled in the back of their head, they began foaming at the mouth. Yeah, okay, listen to these. These are ways to identify real demons. Once the demon manifested, the eyes rolled in the back of their head. Have you ever met someone who can roll their eyes behind in the back of their head, like sh basically show mostly what's in their eyes without being de demon possessed? I have. They began foaming at the mouth. Have you ever seen someone foam at the mouth who's not demon possessed? I have. And so looking at that, that is kind of fearful because I had just been speaking with this person and there was no indication that there was a demonic presence. Maybe they had rabies. <laughs> and then when the priest who was training me, after he brought in the plastic bag and the paper towels, he came in and began the ritual of the church. And when he blessed the person with holy water, as soon as the water hit that person is when the demon manifested. <laughs> okay. Let's run a test, test situation. Let's, let's say you have a jar of holy water and a jar of just plain water. And you have the same, let's say you have 10 demon-possessed people, but they don't know which jar is which. Would you get better than random uh, error on, in that situation? Like the person thinks this is holy water, but really it was just plain water. Or the person thinks it's plain water, but it's really holy water. You know, there's ways to test this, uh, Father Vince Lampert. So there was kind of the growling and snarling, and that's when the, the foaming at the mouth began in the eyes. And... I think my eyes might have gotten really big as well, thinking, what in the world have I gotten myself into? And certainly over the years, you know, I, I've come to not... <laughs> Language and Programming Channel says, you can tell uh, when you smell that gross old book smell. That's demonic. Yes, I know exactly that smell you're, you're thinking of. Or the smell of uh, old books with a tinge of mothball smell. Then you know it's like you got multiple demons. Not focus on the manifestations of evil, because when the de a demon manifests, it's basically saying, "Look at what I'm capable of doing." And the exorcist is trained to focus on what God is doing in this particular prayer of the church. The priest who trained me had been an exorcist for 25 years That's when I was receiving training from him, which is why I think he was unfazed by all of this. And over the years, I've come. You know, everyone's always interested in the manifestations. It always brings a lot of attention. People like to hear those mm -hmm. stories. But an exorcist will tell you the focus is really on the power of God that is at work in this particular prayer of the church. So of all the exorcisms that you've been a part of, which one that you think back to still sort of gives you chills when you think about it? <laughs> tell us the juicy details, Cameron asks. But I would say it was the very first one that I was involved in after returning from Rome in 2006. So I began working with a lady who uh, it was determined that there were seven demons identified in her. Seven. How can you be that precise? What if it was eight or six? And she t shared with me the story that she believed that a friend of hers was possessed. Someone is asking in the live stream chat, Farhan Khan, I am Muslim, but why do you make fun of people's religion? Am I making fun? I guess I am of this guy. Why well, I'm laughing. Uh, why am I making fun of people's religion? 
It brings me hope, meaning, and purpose. <laughs> so out of a misguided sense of charity, she went up to her, looked her in the eye and said, what's ever in you, I freely invite to come in to me. And then she felt a presence come over her. And then she turned to the church 12 years after this event. And then in working with her, these, tw- these seven different demons named themselves. The weakest of the demons are always the first to go. The one that's of a more dominant nature is always the weakest to go. And this one particular demon told me its name was the demon Leviathan, which is a demon mentioned in the Bible. And the demon. Yeah, so I'm wondering if this person had zero knowledge of Roman Catholicism, names of demons, and so forth. Uh, how did you test to know that this was just not this woman saying the demon's name versus a real demon saying it? And was there any cueing going on, a little priming going on, I wonder? The demon told me it did not have to leave because it had been invited in. And because it had been invited in, it was making a claim on the life of this person. And so I worked with this lady over the course of one year before... Uh, and Farhan Khan, you're invited to come on to my show and ask me what, uh, and I'll ask you what gives you hope, meaning, and purpose. She was finally liberated from uh, all the demonic presence in her life. Uh, so, in this case, how did you determine that she was possessed rather than suffering some kind of like serious mental illness? Good question. She she went to see a psychiatrist who gave me a written report. I required her to go see her family doctor just to rule out that there wasn't some physical cause. So there is a a protocol used in the United States for us to uh, determine whether or not this is truly demonic. So, And I wonder if that psychiatrist, that same psychiatrist, was in the room when this exorcism was taking place. And I wonder, again, if this psychiatrist happened to be Roman Catholic or not. So step one, go see a mental health expert. Step two, see your family doctor. Step three... I would look for signs of the... But what were her symptoms that she would go to the uh, psychiatrist in the first place? Demonic that the church has identified. There are four signs. The ability to speak and understand languages, otherwise unknown to the individual. Uh, superhuman strength. Beyond- like if, if someone can speak a language unknown to that individual, why not record it? Why not ask that person questions in that language? Uh, tough questions that, you know, every language has esoteric words within the, its vocabulary. Why not test it? Maybe this person just happened to know, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 words in a certain language and just started repeating it over and over again. You could get language experts in the room who specialize in certain weird languages on earth and see if this person really knows that language or not. Beyond the normal capacity of the individual, having elevated perception, knowledge about things a person should not otherwise know, and then an aversion to anything of a sacred nature, such as being blessed with holy water, being shown a crucifix, having the Bible. Like, th- this is straight out of a movie. Like, ha- if someone is primed in a room full of Roman Catholicism gear, and they see a crucifix, and they know through the movies or through tradition or whatever how to react, and they react that way. How do you separate that from someone who has a real demon in them versus someone who's just caught up in the moment as role-playing what people want them, what they think they want people uh, them to be, a demon-possessed person? Bible placed on your head during a prayer. So all of these could be indicated. I bet you an atheist who doesn't believe any of this could fool this father that they're demon-possessed indications of demonic presence step four I in fact I a question. in fact that's a good that's a good thing i just said we can test this let's and cameron bertuzzi you can set this up contact uh, father vince lampert tell him that we're going to get um uh, how are we going to do this 10 atheists and 10 already confirmed demon-possessed people according to Roman Catholic exorcists, but that Father Lamper doesn't know about, and see if he can identify which are the demon-filled people and which are the atheists pretending to be demon-filled. And I'll tell you, we'll, we'll get these atheists prepped. They'll know all the demons' names in the Roman Catholic tradition, 
they'll even know like 20 words of different languages, like, uh, I don't know, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, whatever. And we'll see if Father Lampert can sniff out. Oh, yeah, you're the atheist. You're the demon. Questionnaire. The Vatican has put out a questionnaire that the exorcist can use to determine if this truly is demonic, then what was the entry point? Some examples of questions would be... What, uh, what is the entry point? The entry, entry point to demon possession is watching the Pine Creek Channel. Um, have you ever been involved in the occult? Have you been, uh, you know, engaged in satanic practices or rituals, witchcraft or magic? What types of books or literature do you read? So again, the church is trying to determine if this is demonic, where did the entry point come from? Step five, very significant, help the person resume their normal spiritual life or to help them create that for the very first time. So again, because the church wants to move in a very methodical process, exorcisms are never done hastily or quickly. I always remind people that there's no such thing as an emergency exorcism. When they're done too hastily is usually when things get out of hand. Maybe the person really was dealing with a mental health issue, but because the priest moved too quickly, then the person was led to believe that this was truly something of a demonic nature. So again, the church wants to move in a very methodical way to give the person the true help that they need. Yeah, the true help they need. Man, but the still, how do you determine that this is really a demon or not? I think my, my experiment would be a good way to start. Have a room with 50% uh, with demon-possessed people, 50% atheists pretending to be demon-possessed, and have, have exorcists from the Roman Catholic Church see if they can just beat random chance at figuring out which are the really demon-possessed, according to those Roman Catholics, and which are the atheists, the fakers. In all fairness, psychiatrists may not be much better. Look up the Rosen, Rosenhan experiment. Well, Tom, um, I come from a hard science background, so I tend to agree with you there. I am demon-possessed right now, says Mountain Show. I can't read or write English. Only Latin, right? Isn't there a YouTube video of people pretending to be um, demon-possessed? Let me see if I can find it. I think I, when I went to the amazing meeting back in, was it 2012, 2011? I forget when it was. Um, they had an atheist pretend to be demon possessed and it was scary. I mean, like it was like funny, fun, scary. Oh yeah. There's, there's a couple of them here, but I don't want to get copyright striked here. Uh, <laughs> oh man yeah well here's something from a tedx talk the myth of de demonic position uh possession hasin tohid alberta yeah i don't think i'll play any of these But what is the percentages like? It's it's really high that the percentage of Americans believe in stuff like demons, angels, demon possession, ghosts. Isn't it like forty percent or something? Guidelines for the Ministry of Exorcism, the light of the current ritual. <laughs> Paula White, yeah. 
Maybe uh, Paula White is demon possessed. But I do think for someone who really believes this stuff, the only way to hope to cast doubt on it. Um, well, the thing is, the reason why these guys believe it in the first place is because the Bible says so. So I guess the real way to cast doubt on demon possession is to cast doubt that the Bible was true about these things. Yeah, and like even, even my wife, even my wife uh, is terrified of Ouija boards. Thank you, Farhan. I appreciate it that you will give me hope, meaning, and purpose. So if you're a Christian, uh, feel free to come on in or a Muslim. Tell me what your reasons for belief are or maybe some of your doubts. Oh, yeah, I'm going to bring up... Uh, Bring up Paula White while we're waiting here. Put her over there. Loop it. Volume. So yeah, Paula White will be working for Pine Creek shortly. Hopefully in the next couple weeks we'll have the contracts finalized. Well, that was Myron in the background, walking back and forth. You guys have heard of me talk about Myron. Yeah, this is Paula White performing exorcisms. No, Joystick Jedi, we don't sign contracts in blood anymore. That's old school. Now we use um, Sharpies. <laughs> we sign contracts, soul contracts and Sharpies. Yeah, Myron did die, Robert C. But as you can see, clearly he came back to life. There he is. I miss that Catholic traditionalist, traditional Catholic guy. He brought me great joy. Yeah, I should have put a drumstick in there. I'm not that tech savvy.
Last chance, Christians and Muslims. I'm willing to stay here. This is another easy question for you to answer is what's the best thing? What's the best part about being a Christian or a Muslim? If you can't answer that question, something's wrong. Yeah, Matthew Simpson. What I was going to do is if someone would come on and tell me the three reasons, the top three reasons why they believe. Oh, hang on. We have someone. We have someone? Stop the music. Okay. Uh, and now they're gone. Hey, uh, I saw you. You can come back. I was just about to click on you, and then you clicked off. I'll give you some time. Maybe your settings weren't right. I saw your name there briefly too, but I forget what it what it was. Robert C says his three reasons why he probably formerly believed was childhood indoctrination, ignorance of doctrine, and fear of hell, hope for heaven. Yeah, those are probably the top three reasons for a lot of people. I'll wait to see if that guy comes back. You need to get Allahu Akbar ringtone. The best part about being a Christian are the moments of transcendence when the music liturgy, incense, and sense of meaning all converge to speak to your soul that God loves you and sacrifice for you. Thank you for responding, chat. Tony? Uh, chat, Tony, if you are a Christian, which I think you are, maybe not, but if you are, uh, do you think you could get experience all those great things and Christianity still be false. Hello, you have to turn the YouTube off. YouTube's off. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. Let me turn you, you up here. Me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's good. Are you a believer? Yes, I am a, a Muslim. Okay, well, welcome. So the question Thanks. is, the question is uh, for you. What are your top three reasons um, why you believe Islam is true? Okay, uh, I think it may be top three or two, or because I think I was trying to think about it. It could be this uh, related. The first one I would have to say is uh, when I was watching all the videos as well, it made me contemplate. I would say causation, like what is the purpose of uh, our creation in general so why are we here that's the first one and my one my personal belief especially i think i was looking at your video you were talking about looking at the video about evil was there's evil in the world mm -hmm. so my second belief is also that's my main one is justice because we believe in islam that god said that he made it haram for him to not serve justice to everybody on the day of judgment so he will if we believe that all the atrocities that happened throughout history is going to get served justice then it's one also one of the main reason why i 
uh, cling on to hope, really. And that's one of my main two reasons, because the purpose, it says so in the Quran, doesn't deny it. It says, God says we created you to, to worship me. That is, normally somebody who is atheist or any other thing, would, any other religion would think that's a, a narcissist would say such a thing. But he, he made no excuse for it in the Quran. He just said, yeah, I created all creation to worship me. Okay, can I... Uh... I'm getting a bit of an echo, so I'm going to mute you when I talk, okay? Or do you have headphones? Okay. No, I don't have headphones, unfortunately. Okay, okay I'll, I'll mute you while I talk, and then I'll kind of put my hand up to let you know that you're unmuted. But um, what I'm hearing you say is the top two reasons you believe Islam is true is because of causation and the idea of justice. And so with causation, it's like, why is there anything here? Why is there something rather than nothing? And with justice is that all the evil we see in the world will at some point be um, accounted for, punished, or some type of retribution for. And likewise, my guess is you also believe that the good things done in life will be rewarded at some point. And without these two things, um, you would not be a Muslim? How did I do? So it's, I'm unmuting you now. Okay, uh, you did. Yeah, that is actually correct because I was at first looking into atheism before when I was born a Muslim, but I wasn't actually certain on it because I was researching more outside of Islam, like other religions or even atheism, like nothing to believe. I didn't see any hope in life. And, uh, but then I started researching into Islam again. I thought, let me just give it a chance because all the things that's happening and I didn't like where I'm going in life myself. And that's where I found my reason. And I've read the Quran and, and I found the reason there. God doesn't actually make excuses. They so just plainly say things. And that's why I believe it's it would be the truth because without any purpose or justice for me, well, personally, I don't think there's any hope in believing in anything. Can I, I don't think I got your name. It's uh, Ka Kashim. Kashim. That's my yeah. That's the the name I'm using. It's not my it's not my real name. Okay. Um. So Kashim, do you think someone can get this this idea of justice, uh, this hope, uh, in justice, from a belief that's false? I do believe they can get it from a belief that is false because. There's loads of other religions out there, like Hinduism, Sikhism, even Shiism. Like, for example, Shiism, they believe that the fourth caliph of Islam, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is, is actually God. They believe in him, just like Christians believe in Jesus is God. Yeah, so how did you, Kashim, and I have you muted right now because of the feedback, but how did you figure out that you were not just like the Hindu who gets this idea of justice and hope and purpose from a belief that's false. Like, how did you figure out that Islam wasn't false? Well, uh, there is a bit of a was it sequence or similarity. It always starts off, I believe, with oneness of God, and then people just uh, do their own thing. They take that takes one thing and then make a sec out of it. Like I said. Uh, Shia, not all Shias, but a lot of Shia in Iran believe Imam Ali is God. And the same thing with Hinduism. They believe in loads of other gods. And uh, I think Sikhism also believe in praying to saints and also one God. They also believe in reincarnation. Okay, but so, I, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I didn't ask you what you believe. I asked, how did you figure out it was true? Like, could Islam... If Islam gives you this sense of justice and hope, and if Hinduism can give you a sense of justice and hope, and one's true and one's false, how would I figure out which is the true one and which is the false one? It's, I think it's because I look at what they bring in terms of where. how can I answer my question? Where? How far does it go? So I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, in, the, in the Quran, people will always ask, if we are created by God, then who created God and it keeps, keeps going and keeps going? Like that, there is no answer to it. In, well, in Islam, it tells you that there is no other one that created God. God is 
they are always been there, always will be there. But we will, this is the kind of question that I always keep asking. I don't find the kind of answers in uh, in Hinduism for for me anyway. Right. I, and the Hindu might say that they really don't find the answers in Islam, and but it seems like the, the truth of Hinduism resonates with them. So how, how do we, like, let me be really specific. I think one of the core, I don't know too much about Islam, but one of the core tenets of Islam is that the very words of Allah were transmitted to Muhammad. Do you believe that is true? And if so, why? I believe that is true because the like there are many prophets that came and we believe Jesus has also gotten revelation just like Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them both, and just like Moses, Solomon, David, they all gotten revelation, not just miracles or be a king or a messiah. They all gotten revelation. And they all had their own testimony and they're all people there, their companions that witnessed them. So they all had all these testimony, evidences, miracles, and revelation outside of just being just a simple text of, or for example, Prophet Muhammad, in his case, being a book of poems. That's what the Arab would say. It was just a book of ancient tales or poems. It seems to be more than just that. So that's why I believe they, that's how they got revelations, not just him, but all the other people, all the other prophets and messengers. I'm not sure if I'm understanding you. The reason you believe that uh, there is a God, Allah, and that he gave his words to the Prophet Muhammad is because it's... Uh, how would you answer that? Why, why do you believe that's true? Why do I believe the... Can you ask the question again, sir? Yeah, why do you yeah. believe that there is a God named Allah who gave words to Muhammad? It is, I believe that he gave word to Muhammad because uh, for guidance to mankind, that is, to put it simply. No, why do you believe it's true? Like, what, could it be the, it, let's assume the, for just for, for a few seconds, that that's not true. That there isn't a God, Allah. He didn't give his words to uh, Muhammad. How would you explain having the Quran in the exact same way we have it today? Be true? Yeah, how could we have the Quran today if it wasn't true? I see. Well, what we go on with is that I'm not an expert, but from what other people have said and what I've listened is that they say that they've the Prophet Muhammad have gotten like, for example, piece of uh, the, the Bible and the Jewish Talmud mm -hmm. when he didn't know, was it Jew, was it Hebrew? He didn't know Hebrew and he and he was already an illiterate who couldn't read or write. So what the Arab were known for was for good memorization. So he spewed out like over 23 years pieces of the Bible and the Hebrew Tell uh, Jewish Talmud to the to the was it to the uh, Arab illiterates, and then but, also on top. But maybe he didn't do any of that. Maybe it was people who were not illiterate. They were literate and they were very specialized. Uh, they were very educated in the texts that came prior to the Quran. What if Muhammad just fibbed? What he just did. Sorry. What if, I didn't quite catch. what if Muhammad basically didn't uh, spit out the all these words that apparently were from Muhammad? How would you figure that out? What if it what if it's true that Muhammad got none of this from a god named Allah? How would you figure that out? What 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 is more likely to you that a deity, a creator of the universe, gave the, his words to an um, illiterate person, or that an illiterate person said that he just Basically, he made this up, and he maybe didn't even write most of the Quran. I would, I would go more with the God theory because I'm a Muslim. But there is always a theory that the atheists or the polytheists would say back then and still do say now, because he was a trader before he became a prophet. And he used to go outside of Arabia and trade with other people. So what they would say is that 
he would hear Jewish people or Christian people actually talking about these stories and he would memorize them and then spit them out for 23 years. That would be their excuse. And they will say he wanted power, he wanted women, he wanted money, he wanted to rule over Arabia. So then that would make him the false prophet if that was the case. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. What does what would you say? Have you ever doubted the Quran or is Islam in general? Yes, I have because I've been looking before reading more into the Quran or contemplating or watching other YouTube videos online. I was looking more into atheism myself and more into science and how science has progressed and we don't really need a God. Once we live this life, we die. But what about and, what about specifically about um, Islam? Did you doubt? Like, can you be? Can you share with us what specifically? you thought of and said, I really don't think this is true. Well, the thing is, I didn't really doubt much into a God, but what I had, my problems was morality, because I have a big problem with, for example, slavery in general. But mm -hmm. we know that Islam or the Arabs is very big on the slavery, and especially the Muslim history in they have a lot of uh, history in slavery, which I'm not very happy with. So that's the thing that may, would make me think, like, why would a God leave, uh, you know, let his people who's trying to make good in the world, but allowing slavery? And to me, slavery, in a way, is evil. Mm -hmm. It is evil, but that's what would make me, was trying to get me out of Islam. That's the one, my main point for me. But yeah, well, uh, I muted you right now. Um, I really appreciate your honesty on on that and sharing that. And I think a lot of Christians, I know way, way more Christians than Muslims, and I think they share some of those same concerns that they look at the Old Testament and they think, well, wait a minute, this is our God, and he said you can have take slaves from the nations around you, not take, buy slaves from the nations around you. And it, it just doesn't seem that this is an all good God if if he commanded this but then there's so many christians who will come up with reasons and i call it excuses to make it seem well it was a different type of slavery and it wasn't that bad and so forth but it it really seems like they have to um have this cognitive dissonance in their head to make it all fit because what really is the issue for them is they need this hope meaning and purpose justice uh, explanation for why we're here and so they're kind of willing to look at slavery and kind of just put push it to the side a little bit and and not worry about it too much do you think this is what happened to you uh i wouldn't say so because for me slavery even to this day is still a problem we still have modern slavery today and people are still denying it in this world but uh for example Prophet Muhammad upon him uh, over the law of 23 years in the Quran when I read it, he said if you have a slave, to free the slaves so that your sin is being erased by freeing slaves. So it wasn't encouraging slaves, it was disencouraging you to leave the to free the slaves. It was sorry, encouraging you to free the slave, so you're freeing your sins. But I know that uh, the second caliph of Islam, Umar bin Hattab, when he conquered Egypt, he actually said to give slavery to the nearest Muslim country, and that continued for 1,400 years. Even though he was very close to the Prophet, rather than stopping slavery, he continued it. So that, to me, was a big problem. I didn't like that. The Prophet tried to stop slavery in Arabia, and he continued it afterwards, so which is like a total going backwards rather than forwards. If you... If let's say a year from now you found yourself not being a Muslim anymore, how would your life change practically? Well, because I don't know much how, but I have an idea because I live with my parents in their house, for example, at the moment. And with a virus that is on the loose, I lost my job this year. So that's going to be very problematic, if you see what I mean. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to be easy. So are you saying that if you left Islam, your parents might kick you out? I wouldn't, I don't know, but I wouldn't say to them 
until I probably get a job and move out myself, then I would be safe to say. But it could be the case. I'm not saying no. I do have, for example, atheists in my family, but they're already married and live in France and stuff like that. They have their own kids. We live very peacefully with them, but their parents were atheists. And so is my uncle. So my uncle is atheist. And so he's my cousin. Oh, wow. But, what um, if you did leave Islam and let's say everything was fine with your parents and you had you were independent and you didn't need them for shelter or money or anything like that? Where do you think you would find this sense of hope and meaning and purpose, this idea of justice? Uh, where do you think you would get that? I uh, probably wouldn't get that in your, in uh, humanity in general, but I would have to do it myself. Probably find it to do it myself, like doing charitable works, helping people by myself, and or helping nature or animals, whatever I, I want to do. But I wouldn't want to rest it all on the government because I know the government, they go to wars, there's modern slavery, there's people on the home, homeless people everywhere, left, right and center. So definitely not the government. It would just be a me and charity and everything I would try to do by myself. And I'm assuming you do some of that now. Does that give you hope, meaning and purpose? Yeah, they, I do that, but it gives me hope and also it makes me contemplate more about God in general saying God tell me to love people says in Islam says I, it doesn't say it's like in Christianity I love love your neighbor like you want to love yourself in Islam tell you you need to love God for the sake of you need to love people for the sake of God so I will say to you Pine Creek I love you for the sake of God it's a bit different than I love you like I love my neighbor something like that yeah do you think it's better to love someone because someone told you to or because you want to? No, only you would want to love that person. But because I was brought up in Islam, you were told to love people because of God told you to love people. If God told you to forgive people, then you are, you're supposed to forgive people. Like I'm an atheist. Do you think... Uh, and you can't hurt my feelings, so don't worry about this. But do you think I am less capable to love my wife, for example, because I don't believe in a God that's telling me to do so? Yeah. You do think? I think that's, that's fine, yeah. You think it's fine? Or do you think I, I can love as much as you or not? I think you can love as much as me. It's just because the, I believe if I'm loving somebody because of God, there's a a result or a reward at the end of that love. You see, I don't know about you or atheists, but at the end of that love, do you get anything out of it? No, I believe when I die, I'm I'm dead. No, I mean, like as a result of loving your neighbor, do you get something out of it? Oh, uh, today, yeah, I um, I definitely do. I think most people feel good when they help others. Yeah, yeah. So, and but yeah, but for for Muslim, yeah, you, once you die, if you if you love your neighbor, you forgive people for doing you wrong, you get something out of it. You get a reward. You get paradise. You get something built for you in paradise you along those that? lines. I would sincerely want believe that because we all fear of death, which is probably one of the reason there's religion in the world. So we are not just dead, dead. But let me put, ask you this way. If, let's say you and I both knew with 100% certainty that there is no afterlife, would you stop loving and helping people? I wouldn't stop loving and helping people. I'll probably still continue, but I probably won't believe in a religion then. Right. But would you even love or stop helping people even just a little bit less? Uh, I'd probably be a bit more looking after myself, but I wouldn't turn my back against other people who is less fortunate because I was just brought up to be more fortunate than others. Yeah, I, th I think I'm the same way that I, um, I really don't think I would help people more if I started believing in God or uh, empathize with people less or more if I started believing in God. So... It makes you wonder whether you even need God for this type of hope or purpose or meaning. 
Yeah, it's just because of the we think of the rewards at the end, and it's not just we die and that'll be it. That's one of the, also the main drive towards helping and forgiving people in Islam. Yeah, I understand. It's just to me, I think I would. If I see someone doing something special for another human being and they know there's zero reward versus someone who does something special for another human being because there is a, a an award, I would think the first person's better. Would you agree? I understand that. I agree. I do agree because it makes perfect sense because you're coming from a unselfish point of view. Well, you probably see this person as being in a way selfish because they're thinking of themselves while helping others. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's leave it there. I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and your honesty. And, um, and you know, is it Kashin you said? Kashin, yeah. Kashin. Okay. Oh, can you tell us what part of the world you're in or no? Are you in the U S I am in the, I live in the UK, okay. but, uh, I was born in Mauritius. Mauritius. Remind me where yeah. that is. There is a tiny little island next to Madagascar. Oh, really? Yeah. What was your favorite foods there? Um, we had we had loads of foods. There is all over the world, but I probably have to say, I like craft cheese, but I don't think that <laughs> that exists here. Craft cheese. I, yeah, I was really obsessed. I enjoy eating it so much. You're not allowed to bring that in the UK. They got their own cheese factory. Yeah, they're pretty big on cheese in the UK. And um, how old were you when you lived there? I lived there uh, uh, till I was 11. Okay, so you still remember it quite well? Yeah, I remember. I remember I did my whole entire primary school over there in Mauritius. Was there like huge lizards and big turtles and stuff like that? Um, they had turtles, but I don't know about the lizards. Or snakes. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I, I don't think so. Okay. No, the snakes. <laughs> yeah, because my wife's family comes from Trinidad, and um, and they, which is an island, and and they basically had these huge lizards and huge toads and really weird animals on the beach. Oh yeah, yeah, but we didn't have those. We had the turtles that. But that was that was it. We had, I think, the dodo is what represents us because it was eaten by the Dutch or the British. I can't remember exactly. Ah. Pretty sure everybody knows who the dodo, where the dodo comes from. The dodo logo. Interesting. Okay. Well, anyhow, I'll let you go. You just press the X and uh, and you're out of here, or the leave button on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Thanks for letting me in. You're welcome. Bye. You're welcome. That was fun. Interesting. It was it was hard for me to figure out exactly why the belief was there. Like, I mean, it was about hope and justice causation, but the details of why Kashin believed that a deity would speak the very words to Muhammad versus any other explanation of how the Quran came to be. I really didn't hear a good reason. Well, she, miracles were mentioned, but I don't think there's a lot of miracle stories in the Quran. There's a few, I think. Atheisms, atheism are just slaves of their ego in a way. Because you can't replicate the Quran. I just did a video on the Quran just this morning. So if you're a Muslim listening to this, watch that video. And one of the experts that a Muslim cited, I looked up and found this um, person. And this person admitted that the Quran 
What makes the Quran special is found in texts that predates the Quran, and the only thing the Muslim can say to that is there's just more of it, more dense, was the word he used. His name was Dr. Farron. So this whole idea, I'll just let Muslims know, this whole idea of the Quran being special in the way it's written is not um, persuasive in the slightest, not even close. If you want me to become a Muslim, pray in the name of Allah that a water-soaked napkin will be on fire in the name of Allah, just like Elijah did in 1 Kings 18. That will help convince a, a, an atheist. But saying that the Quran was written in a very poetic way with certain um, structures that man can't duplicate, I'll be honest with you. I think a atheists and even non-Muslims worldwide will scoff and laugh at that. I'm just being honest with you. It's not even close, not even a millimeter of being persuasive. Poof! Thanks guys for hanging out. Have a good rest of your Sunday. There's nobody to apologize today. I won't, I won't apologize to anybody.